The locals are used to the roar of a World War II Spitfire, but here in Wanaka, they hardly give it a second thought. This, after all, is the hometown of Tim Wallace. Tim Wallace is the kind of reluctant hero they used to feature in boys' own annuals. A star of the skies, a leader of men, generous yet humble. His beloved Spitfire is a machine that seems to typify Wallace himself. It's fast, efficient, difficult to control, and above all, it's a fighter. Wallace was left partially paralyzed after he broke his back in a helicopter accident. He taught himself to walk again, fly again, and then began searching the world for fighter planes. At the same time, from his office out the back of his hangar, he set about building up a multi-million dollar business empire. And when it comes to business, Tim Wallace makes more unexpected turns than he does in the air. Nice to see you. Waiting in Wallace's office, a group of Russians, including the Federation's governor of agriculture. Well, I'm just a boy having fun. Good. Nice to see you. Good. You're wonderful in the sky. All right. Well, I enjoy in the sky. Great. I'm more at home in the sky. Than I am. Really? But the Russians didn't come halfway around the world to talk about flying. They're here to talk deer, and in the deer industry, Tim Wallace is big not just in this country, but internationally. So you have a a, a head start. You have a start that it takes us years to catch up. From his headquarters at the remote Wanaka airstrip, Tim Wallace runs his Alpine Deer Group, a business that stretches from the southern Alps to southern Siberia. We're into the oriental medicine business in uh, Hong Kong, Korea. Uh, then you come to North America. Um, we farm deer in Canada, and we also uh, farm in uh, the United States. Uh, but of course, the biggest base is, is here at Wanaka in New Zealand. deer business, Wallace has always been out in front. He led the boom in commercial deer shooting, invented methods of live deer capture, and pioneered deer farming. In the 80s, 50% of all deer in captivity were from Wallace's stock, and central to it all has been helicopters. The helicopter was a way that I had of making a business out of deer. Tim Wallace uses a helicopter like most of us use a car. You wonder sometimes where you'd be if you didn't have the helicopter. I don't actually think about it. I never, I never think about it, the, the fact that I haven't got one because I've had one for so long. Uh, it's part of my business. It's part of my way of life, I guess. This is a crippled, crippled deer farm now. And... Uh, We've got that mountain and we've got all those deer down in the valley down there. I'll just go and land over here. In the late 70s, Wallace held the world's first deer auction. His stock set benchmark prices. At subsequent auctions, it wasn't unusual for Cripple Park sales to gross more than a million dollars. These days, Wallace is a millionaire about 30 times over. From the outside, Tim Wallace's life looks very comfortable. He's got his own personal helicopter, a luxurious house, a huge property, and a spitfire for fun. But go back a few years, and you see the risks that Tim Wallace has taken in business and in life. As this old film shows, the early days of game recovery were fast and furious. Thousands of deer roamed the mountains, and Wallace was after them. The 
choppers worked from dawn to dusk and later. The rules were loose and anyway, there was nobody there to enforce them. The men who flew and shot for Wallace were tough customers, alpine cowboys who even competed amongst themselves. Overloaded choppers struggled off hillsides, but volume meant profit. When Wallace realised he was shooting himself out of a job, he switched to live deer recovery. The flying became even more demanding and daring. We had margins that we worked to, and uh, an unproductive pilot would have a very wide margin, and a very productive pilot would possibly go over what would you can say is sensible. Did people get killed during those times? There were accidents, uh, yes, yes there were. How many? Uh, well, I don't actually know how many, but there were, I mean, our company has, uh, has lost some very fine people. Do you think about those people now? I do a lot. Yeah, I do. Wallace himself narrowly avoided death. He's come through numerous crashes, but in 1968, he flew into power lines and broke his back. For months, Wallace lay paralysed in the Christchurch spinal unit. What did you think about when you were laid out in there? Well, really, uh, the business was so dependent on me that uh, I really had to, um, you know, carry on that. I had a huge responsibility. Uh, a lot of people working for me. And th that's why they actually the spinal unit was very good. They allowed me to have a, a telephone beside my bed. And I had a uh, radio telephone there as well. So, you know, while I was lying there, uh, I still moved my hands. I could still talk. I was able to uh, really run the business. So you were lying in hospital, you were running a deer shooting operation, a game packing factory, and a helicopter company. And you had a broken back. Yes, but there's nothing, you know, too difficult about that. Uh, it's all in your head and you just carried it on. You really got two choices. You're either alive or, if you, or you're dead. And uh, if you're alive, you really got to make the, the best shot of it. Were you told that you would never be able to fly again? If I was told that, I certainly didn't listen. 1191, we're talking on. Broke reception there. We're going to come down on the vehicle. How would you get out of this aircraft if you had to? Well, I'd uh, pull the hood back. I'd flick this, uh, this harness here. The other harness is my parachute, and I certainly wouldn't flick that one. The first time Tim Wallace flew his Spitfire, he crashed on landing. As wartime pilots will tell you, the Spitfire is an unforgiving aircraft. Its performance still seems awesome, even by today's standards. It's a plane which requires 100% of its pilots. For me, it's a great feeling and, and a great privilege. I believe that I've got a, you know, a rare privilege a rare privilege to own one, and an even rarer privilege to fly one. Now, I remind myself of that every time I fly it. You can cruise along at 150 miles an hour quite gracefully, and then you can zip it up to 400 miles an hour, and uh, you really can use a lot of stride. But Tim Wallace's enthusiasm for aerobatics in the Spitfire has landed him in trouble with aviation authorities. Last year, he was prosecuted for doing a victory roll over the Burwood spinal unit. Why did you do that at Burwood? Why? Well, a lot of the patients there actually uh, asked me, when I'm up in Christchurch, would I take the Spitfire over Burwood and, and, um, and give them a look at it, because they can't come out and see it. I gave them an hour's warning. There was a lot of the beds and wheelchairs out on the sports area. And um, I gave them a look at it. The only thing I did wrong was I rolled it. Tim Wallace's obsession with World War II fighter planes doesn't stop at the Spitfire. In a specially built hangar, hangar, Wallace has another $4 million dollars worth of historic you aircraft. See there, that's the uh, uh, Tiger Moth. Pilots learned on a Tiger Moth and hopped into a Spitfire. And later, after the war, the chipmunk was built for that same purpose. And uh, 
Of course, in the background, that's the uh, Corsair, which is the oldest flying Corsair in the world. I look upon these aircraft as basically works of art. Uh, you know, the people that collect Rembrandts and uh, very famous uh, paintings, and they, they treasure them, they put them in collections or museums. All I'm doing is creating uh, an aerial collection, except my collection, fly. And when Wallace's planes flew at Easter, a crowd of 50,000 turned up. It's known as Warbirds over Wanaka, but most people call it Tim Wallace's air show. How far are the cars set back? Oh, just right back. Just right back. Even in Wanaka. They're actually stacked in Wanaka. Getting a Messerschmitt 109, Germany's most famous fighter plane, flying for the first time in this country, is Wallace's coup at this year's show. He enticed its owner, Ray Hanna of Empire of the Sun fame, to skip a couple of European air shows and come down to Wanaka. Go right down the, 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 uh, um, the line of all the cars, both ways, yeah. and uh, just do exactly what you like, no problem. What about the cops? Don't worry about the cops. No. This is one day you're allowed to do this. The other half of the UK glamour package is Hanna's son, Mark. The ex-RAF fighter pilots agreed to test fly Wallace's Kitty Hawk during the air show. Wallace finally sees the pile of parts he brought back from the States years ago get airborne. Good. It's excellent. Four years. What's it like seeing it up there for the first time? Well, you know, I knew it would fly because we'd got all the hitches out of it. And I think now all it is is just fine-tuning, if anything. That's another one. All right. The hottest acts in the flying scene are here for the air show that's now worth about a million dollars to the local economy. Tim Wallace makes no money himself. He does it for fun and for the community. at uh, 500 feet we're looking away from each other yeah. and then we peel over backwards down come up to a quick stop yeah wait a minute Should we just pull the right over the crowd fence yeah you, no 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 no, 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 no to. Yeah. the other fence other fence okay we go we go from the edge of the runway closest to the crowd okay. mid show to and to wallace fence. leaves right. his we're organizing job on front. the ground okay. for a few minutes flying he can't resist from a distance prue wallace watches her unstoppable husband He's utterly single-minded, utterly single-minded about it, and, he, and he's quite ruthless. He will, he will sacrifice anything to, uh, to achieve what he wants to achieve, which is why he's achieved so much. So. Is that difficult for you? Oh, well, it's, yes. Times when I think I should be somewhere else. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, he's only two inches above the ground. What's it like being married to a man like Tim? Well, it's, it's, it's very... It's, it's, it's often frantic, it's um, occasionally lonely because he's away a lot and it um, can be very frustrating but it's never dull. I, I, I sort of think that, that the boys and I, we have four sons and I feel that we're the sort of eye of Hurricane Tim. Now the attackers are the Harvards and the Messerschmitt. called it the whispering death.
With this year's version of the Battle of Britain nearly over, Wallace is firing himself up for the next air show extravaganza. OK, I can tell you that I'm already thinking about it. I've already made approaches to people. I'm not going to say who I'm going to get next time, but uh, it's going to be bigger and better. The pace Tim Wallace sets himself is frightening. Less than a week after the air show, he's in Russia, chartering a helicopter to reach deer farms in southern Siberia. He's met by the man reputed to be the world's leading deer farmer. Wallace's own video shows the wild and primitive places he does business. Last year he made five trips to Russia, chasing the best velvet in the world. There's got to be the biggest buttons uh, I've ever, uh, ever seen. Now, the Russians are here in Wanaka, looking to do business with Wallace. They're basically here on deer farming matters, and uh, they haven't come all this way for nothing. Tim, are you going to do a deal with these Russians that are here? Well, you know, we'll be sitting around a table tomorrow, and uh, we'll be sorting it out. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, even if I don't do a deal, and uh, I get on to a couple of World War II Russian fighters, you know, I'd be more than happy. In fact, I'd be over the moon.